Okay, good morning everyone and welcome to the eighth in the series of the Coffee Microcaps Morning Meeting. Um, I'm just quickly going to run through a few introductory slides and some housekeeping before we get to our first presenter. Uh, my name is Mark Tobin. and I'm the founder of Coffee Microcaps for anybody who hasn't uh, joined this thing in the past. And uh, just to give you an, an overview of the structure of the webinar for this morning, we've got two companies presenting. Uh, we generally run these every fortnight. They run for an hour, which is broken up into uh, a 20 minute presentation for the company. And then we try and fit in maybe three or four questions at the end in a 10 minute Q&A. If you have any questions, please, um, just put them in the Q&A box, uh, not the chat function uh, in, in Zoom. Uh, the webinar is being recorded and it will be posted on the Coffee Microcaps YouTube channel in the next um, day or two. So if you want to go back and re-watch this webinar or the, any of the previous seven webinars, that's where you'll find us. Uh, you can also find Coffee Microcaps uh, on Twitter at CMicrocaps as I said, YouTube for this recording and all previous recording, LinkedIn, where we do some additional long form content. And then we also now have a subscription newsletter running via the Substack platform. Uh, our first presentation this morning is going to be from High Tech Group. And I'm delighted to have Mr. Elias Hazori with us. And our second presentation is going to come from Mainstream Group Holdings. And Martin Smith, the CEO, is going to be joining us at uh, half past the hour for that. So without further ado, I'd like to hand back over to Elias. Elias, I'm going to stop sharing my screen now, and I'll let you know when I can see the cover slide of your first screen. Sure. Thank you, Mark. I've just started sharing. Just let me know if once it comes through. <clears throat> I can see the cover slide now. Terrific. Good morning, everyone. Hope you uh, are well today. We'll uh, go through some uh, key points in this presentation. The presentation was released to the market uh, yesterday, late in the, uh, in the afternoon, early evening. So you may have had a chance to see it. Uh, if you have any questions, as Mark uh, suggested, uh, put those through and we'll, uh, we'll have a chat uh, towards the end of this presentation. So, uh, Today I'll be talking about the high tech, our full year 2020 results, and we'll go through some uh, slides to explain just what we do and how we do it. Um, the high tech group uh, overview uh, is that we are a leading provider of uh, innovative HR and, and IT consulting solutions for clients predominantly in the federal government and state government sectors. We also have private sector uh, clients and we service them, have been for a very long time. Uh, we've been in existence for well over uh, 26 years, 27 years now, since 1993. We started the company in the uh, days of the recessionary days, apparently the recession that we had to have back then uh, in 1993. Uh, services are obviously constantly evolving in the IT sector and uh, broadening and uh, we're there to capture that uh, those uh, changing uh, needs and demands for our services. We generate the majority of our revenue from uh, ICT contracting and consulting, uh, meaning that our revenue is almost entirely recurring. Uh, revenue is underpinned by long-term blue chip customer base. Um, and I believe we've got the best uh, customers in town, the federal government departments who continually require services, especially IT services and uh, also uh, some of the larger private sector organizations. Uh, conditions have been favorable for uh, growing ICT uh, professionals. Uh, the demand is definitely growing. We are finding that regardless of the kind of current uh, economic climate that we're in and uh, the unfortunate situation we're in in relation to this uh, virus, the, the conditions remain favorable. There is definitely a shift towards uh, remote uh, accessibility, secure remote accessibility, and uh, we're at the coalface of that trying to facilitate a lot of those uh, demands. 
as I said, the brand has been in existence for a very long time. Um, we listed uh, back in April 2000. Um, so on the 17th of April 2000, uh, we listed. That was the Monday, and that was the Monday following the dot-com crash. For some, for those of you who know what uh, what happened back in those days, uh, we've been public ever since, and uh, this is uh, yet another year for us reporting in that uh, in that environment. As I said, business conditions conditions have been favourable. Um, there's growing demand for digital transformation within the marketplace, and definitely for cyber security. Uh, concerns that come with uh, having digital access. There's a, a quick su summation there of uh, the capital structure of the company. Uh, we've traded uh, as high as around the 160 level um, per share. Uh, ordinary shares on issue is about 38 mil. Uh, market cap sitting around the 60 million mark. Uh, we have uh, cash in excess of $7 million. Uh, enterprise values around 52 million. The company is predominantly held by my brother and myself. Um, uh, shares uh, uh, on the registry. Uh, Ray is the chairman. I'm uh, the CEO and, and director of the company. And uh, there's a you know the top 20 are listed in the annual report, and in, in due course we'll release uh, those figures. So if I move on, uh, the board consists of three key people: Ray, myself, and George. Uh, we've all been around a very long time. Uh, we have complementary uh, skills and knowledge. And uh, if you look at our board, it's quite unique in the industry. There really is no other board that compares. We've, we're all experts in this industry. Um, and um, as a consequence of that, uh, everybody has got some very valuable input uh, from the board. <clears throat> I've been uh, CEO for a very long, long time, not officially, but uh, always uh, running the organization, at least for the last 18 to 20 years. So. Uh, quite entrenched in the, in the uh, management of the organization. Our 2020 highlights uh, reflect that we've had another consecutive uh, record year. That's the sixth year of uh, record revenues, EBITDA and MPAT um, figures. We increased revenue by 10% in an environment that uh, has been quite challenging for a lot of our competitors. EBITDA uh, also increased uh, by 8%, uh, 8 and uh, pleasingly, uh, our net profits increased um, and patents increased by 15%. So as I said earlier, uh, the growth is fueled and underpinned by long-term blue chip clients, such as our federal government clients and the strong demand that uh, perpetuates from those uh, organizations. Uh, we believe that organic, organic growth will continue uh, to be strong going forward and we're relying on uh, the industry to, uh, to continue to uh, evolve uh, and as it does, we'll be there to service the needs of the industry. We've uh, declared a fully, fully front dividend of four cents per share recently, payable on the 14th of September. Uh, and that brings our total dividends for the last 12 months to 9.5 cents per share, fully franked. Uh, we declared a special dividend of one and a half cents previously. Annual gross, uh, annualized gross dividend yield is at 8.6% um, at, at the share price of 158, which was the, the case uh, on the 30th of August. Uh, the board uh, does view that maintaining dividends uh, is something that's important and uh, that's the, so far the objective, and we certainly have an, uh, ample cash reserves to facilitate such a uh, dividend. Uh, we do not have any debt. We've never had any debt in the organization. That's how we choose to run it. Uh, we do have substantial cash, and uh, that positions us quite strongly for any future growth, whether it's to do with uh, organic or uh, acquisition. Um, and uh, we're very, very determined to uh, produce another year of consecutive full year record performance in 2021. The sector itself, the IT sector, for those of you who have some idea of what it is, is, is looking quite buoyant. Um, the concerns for most organizations and most CIOs is that, you know, IT service disruption is, is, uh, is their key focus. And because of the advent of digital transformation, and certainly in, in recent months where there's been a shift towards digital communication, uh, cybersecurity uh, is a big uh, concern, especially for government. As you all know, 
there's quite a concern and there's been billions of dollars now, I think in excess of $170 billion allocated to the cyber security center of uh, the federal government to ensure that um, all of government assets are protected uh, from a cyber security sense. So that's quite substantial and it's a big initiative uh, that, that's across the board in Australia, whether it's in government or uh, private enterprise. And we should be able to uh, take advantage of that uh, demand. Uh, there's a significant push towards uh, modernizing and replacing legacy systems. Again, that produces an opportunity for us. So IT services growth is, is projected to, to increase substantially. And I think, uh, you know, whilst this survey was uh, conducted a, a little while ago, your, uh, my, my expectation is that there'll be a higher growth rate than what's uh, suggested there. Competitors uh, are many in our landscape. There are many that are unlisted, many listed, um, many organizations compete in the same space that we do. One of uh, the leading indicators of, uh, of uh, government uh, demand is uh, what's called the digital marketplace that exists for our government agencies to go out and source their IT services and contractors. As, a, as you can see there, there's the top 10 organizations that are listed as the top sellers within the digital marketplace from a, a pool of well over 2,000 suppliers, probably closer to 3,000 now. Um, and you could see that high tech uh, is usually ranked somewhere in that, in that top 10, top three, top five. Um, and uh, we're really quite small in size relative to the other organizations, but you could see that we're quite strong and our band is quite, um, strong in the government uh, sector. And uh, we share some um, interesting company around us. I mean, these organizations, some of them are, are 10 times our size. The value proposition for us uh, is that we have a very different focus when it comes to how we manage this organization and, and, and the drivers uh, for the business. Our combined expertise is in excess of 50 years. Uh, what we try and do first and foremost is to deliver on time for our clients in the most cost effective way. So execution is big for us. Uh, relationships, building strong relationships. We don't want too many relationships. We want good relationships that we can uh, mine and, and uh, develop. And we truly believe in partnering with our clients. And that's probably one of the big differentiators between us and the rest. Uh, we will not go after market share. We're very bottom line uh, driven. Uh, those who know me and have known me for a while will understand that, you know, bottom line is everything. We'll walk away from transactions if they don't make sense from a profit point of view. Our competitors won't. They go for market share. Um, so we're, we're pushing strongly into consulting services, which is a space that's growing and finding um, good traction and, in, and, and uh, it allows us to get quite uh, a deep uh, relationship with our clients. It allows us to uh, get those sticky relationships and it allows us to uh, charge a higher premium for those services. So we're pushing into that space um, and that's that statement of work type of uh, business. And hopefully we can uh, make some uh, ground uh, as we push through this uh, interesting environment that we're in at the moment. Um, so we are quite entrenched with a lot of our clients. They know us. Uh, we've been around, as I said, for a long time. So our brand's quite strong, especially in the government space. And that's uh, paying dividends now. Um, and we are quite flexible. Because of our size, we can respond rapidly to the changing needs of our clients. Uh, throughout this COVID uh, period that, that uh, you know, initiated somewhere in March, we were able to respond very, very quickly to our clients' needs. We're able to continue to provide them with the service that they need. And in fact, change our, our way of delivering the service. And that's because of our size and because of our, our management style. Um, and we have a, a very unique uh, culture, I believe in our industry of financial discipline. Um, and that's, what, uh, that's why we produce such uh, strong uh, profits. We can provide solutions across many different domains, uh, obviously talent acquisition, services, security, um, but a lot of these areas that you see in that slide allow us to really grow the business um, if we see that there's a profitable um, 
demand there for us. Um, so we don't limit ourselves uh, across one sector or one uh, domain. There's plenty that we can uh, target. Our revenue breakdown, most of our revenue, I say, uh, fortunately comes from our blue chip clients, which are government sectors. So the top 10 clients produce most of our, our revenue. And we've been uh, servicing uh, these clients for a very long time. Many of our private sector clients have been with us for very, very long periods of time. Um, and that's testament to our partnership approach as have the uh, federal and state government departments. And there's a further breakdown of uh, the client base and uh, where revenue uh, comes from. Uh, what you'll see there is that we do uh, disperse our efforts across various federal government departments, approximately 14, and that can change from time to time, but we uh, continue to have those relationships. And that, these are enduring relationships that we've had for almost 30 years. <laughs> Our growth strategy, obviously organically, we believe that uh, there's still a lot of room for growth there. The sector is much larger than us. We only really uh, barely scratch the surface there. Um, we want to expand the company's ICT offering into high margin consulting and services space, such as the cloud services, security services, software as a service. Uh, and this will be dictated by our client demands and objectives. Um, we have an, a substantial proprietary high-tech uh, database that we call Highbase. And this database consists of the best candidates in the country. Uh, we really don't tap into that extensively. There's well over 300,000 candidates in that database. Uh, many of them are security cleared and uh, ready to be deployed on site with government and highly sensitive projects. Acquisitions is another area that we want to pursue. If we think that the uh, profile fits us, uh, ideally EPS accretive, well-managed organizations, and they're complementary to what we do, then we're gonna go for it. We've been looking. Um, but to date, uh, things haven't lined up the way we want them to. Perhaps in this, uh, in this environment, there might be opportunity for, for, for uh, acquisitions, but we're actively uh, pursuing that. So I touched on Highbase, that's our proprietary database. I believe that is a uh, differentiator for us. We've got uh, what I believe is best of read candidates in there. Um, and we, uh, that allows us to quickly respond. And uh, a lot of these candidates we've worked with for many, uh, many years, We've almost developed their careers, if you like, over the years. So they've got quite a loyalty to us. And then as we move into the project services space, we have a unique model that we call project delivery as a service. And that will allow us to uh, deliver services in a blended manner to our clients. Uh, obviously, shareholder returns have been quite attractive. Uh, as I said, over the last six years or so, revenues are growing by 15% uh, compounded annually. Uh, EBITDA 25% almost, uh, NPAT 29% growth a year on year, uh, um, not year on year, but uh, compounded dividends quite strong. Um, so it's, it's quite a nice profile. We're very pleased with this and uh, we hopefully can replicate this next year. Uh, cash, very strong, uh, sitting uh, somewhere around the 7 million mark. Uh, and uh, we uh, envisage that we will try and maintain a reasonably high cash uh, level, but only as needed. And that's it. I hope uh, you've got a good overview of the company. And uh, if you need something, um, please ask away. Elias, thank you very much. Uh, we've got a couple of questions. Um, the first one is um, basically about succession planning. Obviously, you and Ray have been involved for a long time. Um, yes. Wow. Are you guys thinking about it? How are you planning for it? Um, you know, I guess if you were to get run over by a bus, you know, who 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 can step up there to, I guess, lead the company when when you two decide you need a need a retirement? Well, I'll make it um, uh, somewhat easier. Ray is really not involved uh, from a, an executive capacity or management capacity. He's more of strategic involvement. Uh, so as far as Ray is concerned, uh, it's inconsequential whether he's, uh, you know, there today or tomorrow or not there. Um, and, and it's probably, you know, uh, time for Ray to step down at sometime soon, but, uh, we haven't really discussed that, but, uh, his involvement is minimal. 
Uh, as far as I'm concerned, uh, I have no desire to leave the business as such uh, anytime soon. However, should the need arise where I, I cannot, or should the situation arise where I cannot be involved, we do have a very structured model of operation. Our people are trained diligently in the system that we uh, have put together, which we believe is quite simple, but unique to the industry. However, the way that we've, we've automated uh, our processes and the way that we, uh, our client management model is such that it really is driven by the brand more than anything else. Yes, I do get involved from a relationship point of view, but do people need me around to know what to do? No, they don't. Do they really need me to tell them how to do it? No, they don't. However, if, the, if there was a situation where I was not around, everybody would have to simply step up and do their job. Somebody could slot in. They would have to be educated about the system. Now, I do have uh, at least two people in the organization who have been with me for close to a decade now, and they could easily slip into the role. Um, however, they'd need maybe some uh, training on the corporate side. But as far as operational, um, that's... Uh, that's well uh, taken care of. Okay, and then another question, the perennial issue about liquidity um, in the stock, I know it's something we've discussed uh, previously. Has there been any yeah. board discussion about ways, means of, I guess, uh, introducing some more liquidity into obviously a fairly hefty acquisition, notwithstanding the cash balance could be a, a, a way to introduce something, but you know, underwritten DRPs, uh, option bonus option issues. Um, I'd just like to get your mm. thoughts on it. We're really open to advice. I mean, the board talks about this from time to time based on feedback we get from the industry, uh, from the investor community. We uh, have from time to time entertained the the um, the possibility of Ray selling down, for example. Um, we've proven that uh, that's possible. Um, we did this uh, some years ago. We, he sold down a small parcel of his shares. So if we needed to, there's no, there's no objection to increasing liquidity as long as the mechanism by which we're doing that uh, makes sense. Um, so we're really quite open to, the, to various ideas. Uh, we don't have any hesitation about relinquishing uh, some some of the, the shareholding that we have as a, as a family, if you like. Uh, so whether it's an event around acquisition or a, a placement, or, you know, a sell down, we're, we're open to it. Uh, I think the perception is that we're not, but we are. So whatever advice we can get that somebody wants to give us and, and makes sense and perhaps, uh, you know, allows us to address this liquidity issue uh, effectively, we'll do. Okay, great. And then another one was um, obviously very uh, entrenched in federal government, um, but I know you have mentioned wanting to expand that private sector part of the kind of customer portfolio. Have you got a, I guess, a target that you'd like to get to? You know, would you like to be 80% government, whether that's federal and 20% and private in the, in the medium term yeah. or or kind of what's the, the, the targets that we should be kind of watching out for in terms of the slice that yeah. goes to private? Can I say, look, um, you may call it luck, but I call it uh, forward planning and it's not magical, but we planned to be aligned with government more than 10 years ago. Given the environment we're in, had we been... 50-50 between government and private, you wouldn't have seen the results that we have today. You certainly wouldn't be expecting the same results going forward. So having federal government, especially as our key client, has been absolutely the right uh, decision going forward. Uh, it served us well, and we know that environment very, very well. Do I want more private? Absolutely. We talk about that. How much? Not sure. Maybe 10% of our revenue. But I honestly don't really want it to be much more than that. I want to mine the government sector more. There is more to be done there. 
they are the best clients in town. And as we've seen throughout the last four months or so, they are the ones spending the money. They are the ones propping up the economy. And they are committed to digital transformation. Whereas private organizations don't have to commit to it. They can talk about it, but they can cut it very, very quickly. And that's the difference. So whilst I'd like to go down that path, I can't see it being more than 10%. If it is, it would probably be a multinational global organization that we know we can dedicate resources to, but have some certainty of recurring revenue from in the future. Okay. And I know it's not really outlined in the presentation, but can you give a sense uh, of the split between revenue in terms of what comes from perm recruitment and what comes from uh, the contracting side of the business? Yeah, about 96% contracting. Okay, great. Again, that was a, a conscious decision we made several years ago because of the lumpiness of uh, permanent recruitment uh, revenue. Uh, you could have one month that's uh, fantastic and the next is you know, down by 90%. So we wanted to uh, have that annuity income stream uh, and have more uniform revenue structure. Okay. Okay. Um I know we're getting close to the close to the half an hour. I'll throw it open now to the floor if there's any final questions. If anyone has one. Um, no. Shall I stop sharing? Uh, you can please. Um, okay. Elias, thank you very much for the, the presentation and taking the time to speak to everyone here this morning. And yeah, uh, your email address, I think, was on the very last slide. If anybody has any further questions, uh, they can feel free to get in touch. Absolutely. Yes. Okay, great. Elias, Thanks very much, Mark. Cheers. Thank you. All right. All um, we're just going to wait now for Martin to join us from Mainstream. Martin. Yes, I'm here. Great. If you want to start sharing your screen, I'll let you know when we can see the, the cover slide of your presentation. Yep, we're ready to go, Mark, when you are. All right. Uh, good morning, everyone, and um, thank you for joining us uh, this morning. Um, Mainstream uh, released its full year financial results on Monday. Uh, and a range of information, including our 4E, 4G dividend statement, compli uh, uh, compliance statement, um, and financial results, and a full slide pack that I'm going to show you today is available on the ASX under the stock code of MAI. Uh, mainstream uh, is a full service fund administrator. Um, uh, on the first slide, on slide three, I'll give you a quick overview for those who don't know much about the business. Um, Mainstream was formed in 2006 in Australia um, and in 2015 on the 1st of October listed as an ASX company. Um, we're a full service fund administrator and I'll spend a bit of time during this presentation explaining what that is. Uh, but we look after circa 1,078 funds uh, with $196 billion. Uh, we operate in eight countries uh, and we have 272 employees as, as at 30 June. Um, we provide a range of services um, and on the ASX there's a presentation with a matrix in the appendix um, if anyone wants any further detail. But basically the, the simplistic way to think about our business is we are the back office for fund managers, um, be it investor services, be it striking unit pricing, providing performance reporting, doing post-trade compliance, doing the financial statements that you receive, uh, doing BAS returns uh, and doing distribution calculations and making the payments to investors for distributions. Uh, we work for about 350 clients. Uh, we have a few very large clients uh, and I'll talk to those and some of them are household names. Um, really, the core strategy for the business has been uh, to be a specialist in what we call fund services. 
Uh, in the last two years, we've been focused on organic growth. Uh, in the first couple of years post IPO, uh, we did a range of acquisitions to build out our platform. Um, and we look to serve clients across multiple jurisdictions. Funds are typically domiciled to the convenience of their investors. Uh, the manager could be located in London, New York, Sydney, Tokyo, um, but typically funds are domiciled uh, in a tax neutral location uh, and typically driven by the preferences and the profile of their investors. Uh, we have a lot of partnerships and alliances, both with large banks, uh, with accounting firms, with law firms and trustees. Some of the trustees you may know, our second biggest client is Equity Trustees, which is an ASX listed company. Our fourth biggest client is Perpetual Corporate Trust, uh, which is also an ASX listed company. Uh, so the business's revenue um, is split across um, all regions uh, and Asia Pacific being the oldest uh, business is also the largest and continues to grow significantly. Um, the Australian business makes up still 50% of the revenue, um, and, but we are seeing an emergence of our US investment, uh, in, uh, US business growing through the investments we've done. Um, some of the financial highlights, uh, we have revenue uh, that increased 11% uh, during the period um, and our EBITDA grew 24%. Um, and we were, were able to grow both our number of funds and our funds under administration um, significantly during the period. Uh, we've made some investments uh, in the US and that business has now become profitable. Um, we have three household names and we recently signed a five plus five year contract with Pendle which is the old Bankers Trust business from the 80s. Um, it has been hived out of Westpac and is its own listed company in Australia. Um, our largest client, and many of you may have heard of them, is Magellan. Um, probably one of the most successful, if not the most successful fund manager of the last 10 years. Um, they joined us in 2007 with 100 million uh, and they're hovering around 100 billion um, very successful, quite a simple business, been inter investing in international um, companies that every one of us consume uh, and they've got exceptional performance. Um, so it's very good. Uh, and our third crown jewel, as we call them, uh, is we have a 10 year contract with Macquarie Bank. Uh, we look after about 40 odd billion for Macquarie uh, in about 140 funds. Uh, we have a couple of different service models that we deliver. Um, we provide full service, uh, including custodial services uh, and some clients, we only provide fund administration, so the back office, uh, and then other clients, we only provide the investor services. The, the reason people use us is the cost of the technology. Uh, we've spent more than $5 million on our core product. Uh, and um, compliance. Um, investors are looking for robust segregation between investment management and their back office. Uh, and the advantage to fund managers is they can focus on their front office. Uh, on to slide five. Um, quite an important slide, just showing the transformation of the last five years. The first three years was about building out the platform. Um, we did the six acquisitions uh, and the last two years has purely been an organic growth story. Um, we raised $10 million uh, in September, 2018 um, to make some investments in our custody business. You're obliged to hold um, uh, net tangible assets of $10 million on any given day to operate as a custodian really to safeguard investors and, and, and um, the monies that are in custody. We invested in the PE business, we've started in the US uh, and that business has grown the last two years, 56% and 23%. And the final one is digital services. So investor and fund manager experience. Uh, we've deployed a custody portal for reporting and instructing. Uh, we've um, deployed an online application so investors don't have to fill out 
the laborious application forms to invest in funds. Uh, and we're currently uh, near completion of a full investor self-service portal. Um, these things take time. We have 93,000 investors in that 196 billion, some big, some small, uh, but security, cyber uh, and fraud um, is, is, is a prevalent risk for us. And um, we, we just need to manage that. So um, you, you need to operate as if you're running a, a banking platform. Um, some of the highlights are that the business, um, as I'd mentioned, has grown to 55.4 million. Our guidance to the market was uh, 54 million um, and we reinstated that uh, in May. Uh, we had a very good couple of last months uh, of the financial year. Uh, we found a lot of new funds launched. We had 24 new funds in Australia launch, um, capitalising on the low point of the markets to seed their funds. Um, we also have the advantage that there's a huge amount of money swimming around in, in the investment space. space. In, in the markets we operate, there is circa 40 trillion. Um, so our, our 196 billion um, is quite small in comparative, uh, but it also presents a significant opportunity for us. Uh, the funds that we administered increased more than 250 funds in the last two years. Probably the only call out is the clients has stayed about the same and, and we think that's a good thing. Um, the bigger the client, the, the more margin and, and the less overhead we have. We've seen a number of our smaller clients close during the period. We had about 12 closures, um, but as you can see that the funds um, have significantly increased. So rather than us be looking after a boutique, say with 40 or 50 million uh, who can't really pay the bills, uh, we're finding that we're engaging with clients who have multiple products. Um, this shows you the path of growth um, over the last, um, five years since the IPO and um, very pleasing um, CAGR rates that we both have in revenue. Uh, and a big call out is that the EBITDA has grown faster than the revenue, which means that we're improving the margin uh, and we're putting that money to the bottom line. Uh, and another call out is you would see, um, particularly with uh, the challenges of COVID that our second half EBITDA in FY20 um, is exceptionally good, um, significantly better than any other quarters that we've seen. Uh, and we anticipate those, um, that, rec um, that performance to flow into subsequent years. Um, some of the financial highlights, um, the operating margin has increased by 38% and the EBITDA margin has increased by 24%. Um, there is a slide in, in the appendix. Um, our NPAT, while small, contains quite a lot of cash, uh, non-cash items. Uh, and the pleasing thing uh, is we had contracted revenue at the beginning of the year of 47, um, and we achieved 55.4. So the business converted a number of its prospects and opportunities during the period. We also had um, a very good year cash flow wise. Um, our cash from operations was $10 million and um, it reconciled to, to our revenue for the period. So our collections are very good. Uh, we've done a number of investments which have affected the EBITDA uh, and we expect those investments to bear more fruit in, in the future. Um, the two call outs are, uh, we put four salespeople on the ground scattered around the US um, to put it in context, how big that market is, um, there are 35,000 funds in the US, which makes our 1,000 look tiny, and with more than 150 million in each of them. So they're registered with the SEC. Um, last year, there was 3,500 new ones. To give you a comparison to the Australian market, this is in the private equity space, to give you a comparison to the Australian market, there was only 32 new funds in Australia last year in the PE space. Um, so massive opportunity um, and those investments in resources to generate and grow our business um, 
will will pay significant dividends in the future. We've also looked at our succession across the business uh, and we hired um, one of my um, sort of ne my nemesis from Link. Um, Link is one of our traditional competitors in Australia, uh, as is OneView. Um, and we hired um, the ex-CEO of Whites, which was a business that Link acquired. Uh, and Andy Harrison is now running the Australian business. It's very much been a year of consolidation, um, digesting the six acquisitions, getting them on the same accounting systems, the same administration systems, um, getting the teams to work collaboratively together, uh, and it's setting us up for a bright future uh, and really pushing our organic growth. We have a pipeline at the moment um, of $27 million. Um, we use um, Salesforce to track our pipeline uh, and we apply probability to that pipeline depending on where proposals are at. 25% uh, if we've issued a formal proposal, 50% if um, we're being shortlisted to two, 75% uh, if we have issued a contract that will have a verbal and 100% if we've signed a contract. Our qualified pipeline at the moment is 8.5 million of that 27, but our historical conversion rates are tracking at 56%. So of the 27, it's more likely that we would exceed that 8.5, but very pleasing um, considering the macroeconomic situation. Um, we declared a dividend uh, at the full year on Monday, uh, and that'll be paid in October. Um, I'll talk a little bit more about that later on. Um, so here's the dividend. Uh, we didn't do a half year interim dividend. We have done dividends since 2016, uh, since we IPO'd. Uh, we just were a little bit nervous about the macroeconomic situation uh, at the half year and we wanted to preserve our cash. Uh, we have quite a healthy franking credit balance. Um, and, but, and we decided that we would reinstate the dividend uh, and it was a one cent dividend. Um, our target uh, dividend ratio is 3%. Um, it will be 50% franked. And the reason for that is that we earned last year 40% of our profit offshore. And this year we expect um, it to be greater than 50%. Um, uh, we have a sufficient franking balance, uh, balance um, to do that. Uh, and really the way you should think about the company if you are looking for an income stream is um, one cent a half year is really the floor of what we believe the dividends will be. Um, it equates, we have 131 million shares on offer. So a one cent dividend equates to 1.3 million. Um, what we did do this half year uh, in, in the full year, I beg your pardon, um, is we decided to balance our working capital, our debt uh, and, our ca uh, and our dividend. Uh, and we decided rather than to do a two cent dividend, uh, which could um, be likely in the future, we decided to reduce our debt um, and, and preserve our cash. That is a, a debt facility we can redraw on. Um, so depending how the COVID tail pans out, um, we always have that protection. Uh, we actually have a net cash position. We had 14.7 million of cash um, at uh, 30 June. Uh, we have regulatory capital that must be in physical cash of 8 million. Um, so we have circa 6.6, 6.7 million of free cash uh, and 2.3 of that will go out in dividend and reduction in debt. Um, to give you an idea of our growth um, since 2012-13, uh, we were sitting at $20 billion uh, in 2013 and we've now achieved $196 billion. You can see um, there's quite a bit in, in the right hand slide to talk about. Um, you would have seen in the March quarter that the, the stock market, uh, the markets generally fell 21% and we were really pleased that we actually stayed the same. Uh, slightly down 400 million, uh, but in the scheme of things, um, it's testament to the resilience of our clients, um, having some very smart clients like Magellan, Macquarie and Pendle. Uh, and also um, we have asset and geographic diversity. So typically alternative funds, hedge funds outperform in falling markets. Um, so our revenue is insulated uh, by that um, protection. 
the other thing to call out is we only recovered 4.4 of the 8.3 in market movements. Uh, so there's more opportunity for that recovery to occur going forward. Um, for those who don't know, net flows is really um, new investors or new clients with new funds uh, and market movements is repricing of assets um, uh, benchmark to a data source or a market or a valuation. Um, this gives you an, an, an idea of the breakdown of our clients. Um, the light blue is the long only fund managers made up of Magellan and, and Macquarie. Uh, there's less clients there, but bigger assets. Uh, the hedge funds, there's a lot more clients, but a smaller portion of the assets. And the private equity, which we've only been running for two years, uh, has now got 60 clients and $18 billion. We have a, quite a small super business, uh, about eight clients, all under contract and about um, 600 million. Um, quite a good capability. Uh, we use it and it integrates into our funds business as people use super uh, high net wealth accounts, IMAs, SMAs and funds uh, as a suite of products to manage their, pro um, their investors. Uh, we've had 13 of our clients for more than five years and the call out on the seven clients is a lot of them are new emerging money managers. Um, so they're not necessarily been with us for five years. They may have only existed for less than five years. Um, and these are some of the logos of some of our clients that have given permission to, to be in this presentation. Uh, if you get nothing else from this presentation, there's really five key messages. Um, we've had solid track record of growth and we expect that to continue. Uh, we've secured long-term contracts with strategic clients. Uh, Magellan's about 12% of our revenue. The biggest challenge we have with Magellan as we grow is they seem to grow faster than us. Um, you would might have seen they've launched a number of new products and a retirement solution. Uh, and they're also um, released last month or earlier this month, um, a merger of number of their global products. Uh, we're in a good place with those opportunities. Um, in some cases, their existing funds we administer and in others, there'll be consolidation uh, that we're currently negotiating to come to us. Um, we have a high degree of recurring revenue. More than 90% of our revenue is reoccurring. Um, also, um, the 10% that's not, uh, when the markets were bouncing around in, in the early part of um, this calendar year, uh, our transaction volumes went up two and three and 400% uh, in different months. Uh, and also our cash in custody, which we earn income from, uh, increased from 6% to 13%. Uh, we have seen and we continue um, to improve our uh, margin. Uh, and we're also conscious of rewarding our shareholders by balancing our working capital, dividends and debt reduction. Um, there's some very favourable trends in the industry. Um, I don't know if any of you have heard of this new product that we built called a quoted fund. Um, Magellan launched it in June. Um, it, uh, they launched it with their early Australian share fund. Uh, you can basically trade an unlisted fund on the ASX as if you're buying or selling BHP. So for investors, there's no laborious form filling. You, as long as you've got a broker account of some description, uh, you can buy and sell that fund uh, through your uh, broker. Uh, that is a big opportunity for us. Uh, we spent about $1.2 million building that solution. Uh, and at the moment we have six funds, other managers going live with it um, and 42 inquiries, both from existing clients and competitor clients. Um, we think it's an Uber moment for our industry. It's long overdue that managed funds and investments are more efficient uh, and more easy to transact in uh, in 2020. Um, so there's a significant opportunity there. The other emerging trend is investor demand for digital. We have an online portal. We have about 40 odd thousand investors and advisors who have logins. Uh, we're just about to switch on our self-service. Um, people are looking for a better digital you know, experience, particularly being cooped up at home uh, with COVID that they can see their investments and their portfolio. They can transact and they can do maintenance. Um, there's also an, an impetus on 
uh, privacy uh, and data protection, a uh, number of privacy legislations being put out across the globe. Uh, and we've built a secure means of exchanging data with various market participants. Uh, there's in, increasing complexity in, in, in the operating environment and regulatory environment. We have six licenses in, in the countries we operate in, um, and there's very high barriers to entry. Um, we think about it as we have a moat around the business because of that license. There's this um, sort of a dichotomy that uh, you need a client to have a license, but you need operational competence to have a client uh, and the chicken and the egg debate begins. Um, because we're an incumbent and existing provider, um, the, the, the opportunity for growth, particularly with the compounding rates in, in compulsory super are significant. Uh, we're seeing a continuing trend to outsource. Investors are looking for governance. Um, and in the US, there's a high degree of insourcing. Um, people are running funds. Surprisingly, I meet people who run billion dollar funds on spreadsheets. Um, and we've got industry grade technology. Uh, and there's also market consolidation. Uh, there's currently um, Linker going through executive change, uh, focus more on their super in the UK business. Uh, we have one view currently under takeover um, from Iris. And um, it, globally, we're seeing a lot more private equity buying our competitors. Um, so we give clients the transparency, we give the investors the, the transparency of being listed. Uh, and we have some what we call crown jewel clients like Magellan. And, and they attract other clients because people say, I want the same as Magellan, or I want the same as Macquarie. Um, very pleasing and exciting. Um, just finishing on the outlook, um, so the outlook for next year is 65 million and 11.5 million EBITDA. Uh, we've been quite conservative in um, presenting those numbers. Uh, we want to um, meet or exceed those numbers. Um, we have at the moment 62 million of sold work. Uh, so achieving 65 is not a great stretch, particularly as we talked about 8.5 of qualified um, leads. Uh, and the EBITDA is 24% um, up on this year. We are exposed to exchange rates. Um, so we have modeled this guidance on 72 cents to the USD. Um, so if we see some commentators believe the Aussie dollar could go to 80, others believe it could go to 60. Uh, we'd obviously prefer it to go down, not up, uh, as our earnings are offshore. Um, but it does have some sensitivity. Um, and client closures, market movements, and interest rates are other factors. And really the tail of COVID could play out. We didn't see any effect um, of COVID. We thought we would. Uh, we, didn't, we weren't eligible for JobKeeper. Um, so the business profit um, uh, doesn't have any benefits from JobKeeper. We got some tax deferral. Uh, the CapEx, couple of areas, we wanna create a more permanent solution for infrastructure. Uh, and we're continuing to invest more in um, fraud and cyber controls. There's been a number of um, high profile um, ransomware attacks uh, and fraud attempts. People were trying to defraud the ATO for early release super. Uh, so we're investing quite a bit of money in that. Additional money, we have quite good controls uh, and touch wood, we haven't had an, an issue. Uh, but you can't be complacent, particularly around fraud and cyber. Um, the dividend outlook is to continue to reward shareholders. It will be partially franked, um, but the target rate is really a, a, a two to 3% yield. Uh, a balance sheet is very strong, uh, strong cash generation. Um, we will be reducing that debt. Um, it matures in January 22. Um, we could easily pay the whole debt out. It's pretty cheap, it's, it's in the low threes. Um, so for um, debt not secured to property in the low threes, um, it's a cheap form of cost of capital. And we have headroom uh, with that. Um, on that note, I'll hand over to questions. Um, thanks, Martin. Yeah, I've got uh, two questions for you. The first one is, um, I know it's not mentioned in your presentation, but can you give us an overview of kind of who uh, the major shareholders are and I guess, um, concentration in the in the top 20. Sure. 
Um, so we have about 13 institutional fund managers on our register. Um, they control um, circa 30% of the business. Um, some of them have been with us in IPO. Um, some of them have got into the business more recently. Um, as the market cap has increased, we've um, been able to attract some larger funds. Um, and I've been meeting with a number of them this week. Um, myself um, and two other insiders, uh, I'm actually the largest shareholder. I own 15% of the business. Uh, and two other directors, non-execs, um, own between uh, own 23%. Um, so insiders uh, in the top 20, um, there's 38%. Uh, then there's a 30% of institutions. Uh, and then we have about 1,800 retail investors. And we are the reason I'm doing today and the reason um, talking to you is we're really interested in broadening our shareholder base. Um, retail investors tend to um, be patient, uh, more so than institutional investors. Uh, and by broadening our register from just under 2,000 upwards, then um, that improves the liquidity of the stock. Great. And then another question is around, as you said, there's a lot of corporate activity in the sector. And um, we got a question, do any of the three Crown Jewel clients have out clauses in their contracts should mainstream receive a takeover offer? Um, so one of them has a consent to a change in control. Okay. Um, the other two would be a courtesy. Um, it'd be foolish to, to not engage them. Um, so the three of them account for about 20, 2% of the revenue. So it's not, it's not a 60% type behemoth. Um, the three of them account for about 22% of the group. So we have good diversity, but clearly they would be engaged if there was m and &E, &E activity. We, we don't have plans. We get approaches all the time from people. We um, had two serious approaches this year. Um, the way we're thinking about it is we're really excited how we fared this year and the future prospects. Uh, and uh, we think through organic growth, we can deliver significant shareholder return. And therefore we don't really want to entertain um, any of those approaches. And then a question on the new Magellan cohort fund product um, that you spoke about in the presentation. Uh, does does that translate into higher margin for you at the end of the day, or is it net net margin similar? To oh no, it's imp so the the standout margin areas for us are custody. Our margin in custody is 50, 50 odd percent. Our margin in private equity in the U.S. is thirty percent, uh, and our margin our margins uh, in our Asia Pacific business are all north of forty percent. Uh, we've built some nice clean businesses that are growing really well. We've had compounded growth, annual growth in Hong Kong, surprisingly, particularly with all of the political tensions going on, but um, we've had a growth of 102% on the last five years in that business. We did some small acquisitions in 2014 and 15, and there, there seems to be a, a five year brand awareness program that people get comfortable with you and your presence. Um, and we're looking to replicate that in the US over the next three years. Okay. And then yeah, just another question coming back to um, acquisitions. As you said, from IPO, there was a bit of acquisitions to build out the platform. The last two years has been organic. Uh, is the future a mix of the two or is it a, a, a continued focus on organic? So the private equity firms that are buying into this sector have created, um, let's call it a, a bubble. Um, they're paying in the vicinity of three or four times revenue. Um, and um, we, we, we have looked at a couple of businesses this year. Um, the prices just aren't reasonable. I mean, we, to give you a comparative of the organic growth costs. So if we are paying three or four times revenue, um, we grew the uh, US business uh, in the year by $4.4 .4 million. Um, and the cost of those four people to do that growth was $1.2 million, Aussie dollars that is. 
And if you're paying three or four times revenue, uh, we would have paid 16 to $20 million for those businesses if we'd bought them off someone else. So the cost is 20 to 30% of revenue. Uh, and therefore, um, we think the organic growth story is cheaper. It also means that the quality of the data that you get and the clients you get is um, determined by us. Uh, it, we don't inherit someone else's problems. Uh, and we are, don't also inherit any client risk that someone, once they're acquired, they don't leave the business because they are wedded to the previous owners. So the quality of earnings, the cleanliness of the data, the ownership of the relationship resides with us. So while we have a pipeline of $27 million um, and you know we, 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 we could spend unlimited amounts of time on those clients to convert them, um, we think that's a lot better use of our time and our money. Great. Martin, we've just gone a little over time. Um, I'd like to thank you for your time and your, your presentation this morning. I'd like to thank everyone else for joining. And as I said, the, the recording of Martin's presentation and Elias's presentation will be up on the YouTube channel in the next day or so. Um, I'm conscious I do want to end now because the opening match and it is results season. So Martin, if you could stop sharing your screen and then I'll, uh, I'll just end the uh, webinar for everyone. Great. Thank you. Okay, thank you everyone and enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you.